Welcome back to Inside Personal Growth. This is Greg Boyce and the host of Inside Personal Growth. And joining me from actually right down the street, <laughs> we, we probably could have run back and forth to each other's house, uh, is Ryan Berman. Ryan has a book called Return on Courage. It's a business playbook for courageous change. As you can see, his courageous boot camp uh, behind him there. Uh, Ryan, good day to you. How are you doing? I'm doing all right. How about you? Pleasure having you on the show. I'm doing wonderful for a Monday morning and the day before the election. Uh, we're going to see what happens. Yeah, do we want to go down that rabbit hole already? <laughs> no, I just, uh, <laughs> you know, obviously it's something that may or may not be on our listeners' minds as they listen to this. Actually, after they listen to this, it's all going to be done with. So, um, but any rate, it's a pleasure having you on. You were linked to me by Michael Bengay Steiner off of LinkedIn, and I didn't know you prior to that. And I appreciated Michael for that. And then uh, we had a breakfast and we kind of went from there. And I'm really impressed uh, for all my listeners with uh, Ryan's background. And Ryan, I'm going to tell them a little bit about you. Um, he has more than 20 years in the courageous idea space and uh, intimate understanding of the intricacies of emotional storytelling for the purposes of driving courageous change. Ryan, a practitioner and authority on the subject, has had his methods featured in Entrepreneur, Fast Company, Inc., and Forbes. In addition to giving talks at Google, Snapchat, and Charity Water, Ryan speaks all over the country to C-suite marketing and professional service audiences on the topics he covers. The learnings found in his book, which we're going to be talking about this morning, Return on Courage, a Business Playbook for Change. As I said, he lives right down the street from you, and most of my listeners know I live here in Encinitas. Um, he has a good fortune of creating stories for household brands such as Caesars Entertainment, Johnson & Johnson, Major League Baseball, Puma, Qualcomm, Subway, UNICEF, and the list goes on. Well, it's really a pleasure having you on the show, and I'm going to encourage my listeners. You can find Ryan at Ryan. R-Y-A-N-B-E-R-M-A-N.com, or you can go to www.couragebrands.com, and we'll have links for that, Ryan, in our podcast blog entry so everybody can find you. You know, you took a thousand-day journey and a deep dive in the subject of courage, and what makes you really qualified? You know, you and I sat down and had a cup of tea and breakfast to speak with our listeners about courage. You know, that's an interesting one because, you know, I always wonder, was I, am I born with courage? When was I ever courageous? And if so, do we even look at the things that we are courageous for, which would be mm -hmm. like an entrepreneur going out and starting another business? I think that takes a lot of courage actually. Yeah, no doubt. And uh, by the way, just for the audience sake, um, Greg chose to re read that bio. I'm like, yeah. so, so I always get uncomfortable when it's like, oh, wow, <laughs> you, you're back like that. <clears throat> you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a recovering ad guy. You know, I, I came out of the advertising industry. And actually, even when I started working on Return on Courage, the, I remember early in the book writing process, it's probably 2015. And uh, the universe is just a funny, funny place where, uh, a woman named Loretta Hidalgo, she was a, is a founding astronaut of Virgin Galactic up in Orange County. And she calls me up for lunch when you could do those things without having to wear a mask. Right. And, uh, so I pop up and at the time, I'm really not sure what I'm writing. You know, I mean, I know it's a book about courage. I feel pretty confident that, you know, at the time I was running a 70 person creative agency that when we would present the courageous idea to a client that that really lit up my team and those, those ideas seem to work for the client. And that, that's how I landed on this concept of courage brands. But I was like, well, what, about, you know, what is, what is the root of that? What does courage mean? And this is going back to like, am I qualified to writing a book about courage? And uh, I kid you not at this time, the only thing I really fear is don't ask the astronaut a stupid question. You know, like, don't sound stupid to an astronaut. And before our trays even at the table, she says to me, so what makes you qualified to write a book about courage? 
I go, touche astronaut. <laughs> you know, well, I, you know, I have been writing pithy one-liners on Twitter for a living. That's pretty courageous. And she's like, no, 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 no. She's like, I didn't tell you to write this book. Why are you writing this book? Like, you've been working on this long before me. Part of your journey is to figure out why you're writing this book. And she proceeded to tell me that her definition of success was when there's no daylight between the personal you and the professional you. And that comment alone, you know, as a guy that's been in the service business for 20 years, who maybe had surrendered myself a percent a year for different reasons, you know, biting my lip to a CEO when I thought he was picking the wrong idea or um, taking that call at midnight that I shouldn't take. It, it really had me driving back in silence from like with my hands in the 10 and two position, just thinking about, okay, this book is now taking on an incredibly different sort of a, uh, end goal than I thought. Um, you know, I'm an observationalist at heart. So for, for three years, I got to get quiet and go on this listening tour and interview what I call the three Bs, the brave, the bullish, and the brainiac. And on the brave side, it was people like Loretta, Navy SEALs, tornado chasers, a bank robber, a bank teller who was robbed at gunpoint. Bank robber would have been interesting too. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I was just fascinated by like, how do they do what they do? Like, how do they shoot themselves up in space? Or Navy SEALs are very aware of what they're going to see in the field, yet they do it anyway. On the bullish side, leaders at Google and Apple and Harvard and Method Soap, president of Domino's, and uh, was sort of fascinated by how some of the largest companies on the planet are also the most agile. You think it was the little company that could pivot fast? And then on the Brainiac side, you know, I went to television radio school, Greg, so I really had zero clue on how we were wired. And I wanted to understand the inner workings of the brain. So I sat with immunologists, Cambridge PhDs, clinical psychologists, co-writer of The Secret, John Asaraf, who's actually here in town, um, and just really threw it all in the soup. And, um, you know, I, I've actually sparred with the question, is there a difference between being courageous and observing courage? And when I actually look back at the choices that I've made since I moved to the market from New York City, uh, you know, I started my first company, four people off of a, you know, in a, in a house, basically, uh, and grew it to 70 folks. And, you know, I think it's just you see enough of this stuff and you start to sort of get the duct tape out and recognize the differences between what I would say are a courageous move and a careless one. And... The ones that are courageous are the ones that are, are pivoting forward. Yeah. And, you know, it, it, there's so many ways to be courageous. You know, you can uh, do like people ask me, well, you're crazy because you did fly by way or down in uh, New Zealand and you've jumped off bungee cords and you've been up in planes and you've uh, skydived and you've done all these kind of strange things. I, I don't look at that as much as maybe the first step is courageous, right? But courage long-term is really a different story. You know, every day to wake up and be courageous, to take the step to do something different. And, you know, you mentioned uh, it does not take much courage to work at your nine to five job, uh, but to become an entrepreneur is a courageous act. And I would say it really is. I mean, I've studied entrepreneurs, been doing this show for almost 14 years, Talk to plenty of business people, 850 of them that have written books. Um, you, and you want people to get two things from reading the book. You say maximize the return on investment and the return on relevance on Courage platform. How would you help our listeners kind of get there? In other words, just kind of explain that process. Yeah. So as per the title of the book, Return on Courage, mm -hmm. you know, I think the way to, from ROI to ROC is sort of the idea. Um, and I think any willing business being or brand who have lost their way can return on the Courage platform. And, and the concept here really is, okay, so how do you do that? And um, it's funny that you say Courage is at the beginning. I think Courage is at the beginning if you have a clear understanding of what Courage is and very similar to you. I mean, we're both compensated observationalists, really, right? I mean, your job is to deconstruct leaders. You've seen 850 of them on how they're doing what they're doing and you find commonalities. And um, 
look, when you j- jumped out of a plane, they didn't just let you jump out first. I'm sure there was some sort of training before you went up there and did it. Oh, even yeah. if it was an hour. Yeah. And, um, and so, you know, I think it starts with really looking at the definition of courage. And, and I remember early in my book writing process, looking at the dictionary definition and like Webster's dictionary definition is the ability to do something that frightens one. Mm-hmm. I'm like, do you want to do that? I don't want to do that. Like layer on a, how about do that at work? Not like, please step forward. I'm taking a step back. And I don't think anybody wants to do terrifying things at work. Mm-hmm. By the way, as you've mentioned already, we're, we're really not compensated to be courageous at work. So if you're an entrepreneur, it's easier on you to have annual reviews. I don't have to like bring this topic up for a year. Okay, now let's do an audit of how you did. Maybe somebody gets a 5% bump, a new title, and, and we move on for the next year. But that's, that's not really working in your favor. Like how are, you, how are you creating a Pavlov moment quarterly, monthly for rewarding courageous behavior in the workplace? We're, we're not doing that right now. So what happens with the workers is they're not sticking their neck out. They're doing just enough to get to the next bump, get their little 5% bump, and they're not wired to be that way anyway. So we're not rewarding them for courageous behavior. Uh, Annual review comes around. Maybe they get their bump. Maybe they leave. Now, and I know we were going to talk about this in in a bit, but I think it's important to like establish like where I landed on the definition of courage. Yeah. What is your definition of courage? Um, So my definition is it's, it's sort of algebraic. There's three levers to it knowledge plus faith plus action equals courage and it has to be all three for it to be a courageous move so in business you're never going to have every bit of knowledge you need to make a call you know i'll I'll challenge the data people now if you think you can wait for all the data to come in you're going to be you're going to get passed you're never going to have a hundred percent of the answer and entrepreneurs know this right so Mm -hmm. but but the more knowledge you get on a topic Hopefully, the most more your faith is growing as well. When we talk about faith, we're not talking about the religious side of this. We're talking about the inner belief, the the intuition side, the feel side. And then but with long- that data, let's say that for a second. With that data, Ryan, you do reduce risk. Uh, yeah. Now, courage has risk associated. I guess the question is, is how much risk? Um, really good entrepreneurs are always looking for ways to reduce the risk. Yeah. trying to find the data that if they can see around the corner and they see it coming to them, right? They're saying, okay, I'm not predicting the future, but I have an intuition about the future, like you just said. And I think X, Y, Z would be a good way for us to navigate in that direction, right? Yeah. But and yeah. as you know, if you wait too long, trying to reduce the risk, that becomes the risk. because that, That's true. That's you know, true. You're getting, you're getting it's a fine by. line. It's a fine line. It really is. And, and I think this is the... This is the point of the of the um, of the the three levers, right? Because it's like, okay, knowledge. What do I know about this situation? Mm-hmm. Faith. What do I feel about this situation? Right? Like, okay, now what? How often have we been in a position where we knew the right move, even when we didn't have all the data? We knew the right move, we felt it to be the right move, and yet we don't do anything about it. We take no action. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, the irony, I, I believe, is that two of three of the levers in any direction is not courage. You've got knowledge and faith without action. That, to me, is paralysis. And faith and action without knowledge, that's reckless. And then knowledge and action without faith, if you're numb or you're just going through the motions, you're probably working on status quo. You're working on safe. And when your idea hits the marketplace, uh, and you're not there to defend it on the shelf because you can't be on every shelf, right? Pointing to this as your product and sliced bread, buy this. It's going to blend in with everything else. And it's why we feel so strongly about courageous ideas when we always say courageous ideas are the only ones that matter. We really believe that. Yeah, and it's so true because it's um, this is central to your central courage system, okay? And I'd like you to tell our listeners, you know, because – I've gone through the book. They're not at that advantage. And that's why we're doing this podcast is so that they'll <laughs> go get your book and look you up on the web. What are the central courage systems and, and really what is it? Because you have an acronym. I do. Just what the world needed, right? Another guy with a method and a whole thing, right? Just sorry. Sorry, America. Sorry, the world. Um, you know, again, going out of my, and I, I want to just also say that 
to me, I always felt like the book was more like a documentary than a book. Like when I didn't have an answer, I went out and, and, and tried to seek it out. And mm-hmm. it wasn't like a soapbox book of Ryan Berman's 20 tips to getting ahead. Right. And so one of the guys I met along the journey, his name was Nicholas Alp. He's Cambridge PhD. He was my brain Sherpa. He was the one that really kind of like layman termed it down for me. So I could actually understand the way that our brains work. And he basically describes our brains like, like a reverse onion, right? Like when that thing happens to you in high school, it's still there. Like it's sticking. You know, this is our central nervous system. This is why 95% of us are freeze or flight. And, and we've created like no strategies to cope with it other than to put something else on top of it. (laughs) Another move when maybe uh, your first boss bit your head off or, you had a failed entrepreneur opportunity and you've now have this big chip on your shoulder and it becomes like a tick. And um, I mean, he basically goes on to tell us that we're still cavemen and cave women. And just because technology has advanced doesn't mean that we've advanced. So great. Your smartwatch could tell you how many beats per minute your heart is racing, but it has no data whatsoever as to why your heart's trying to escape your chest. Mm-hmm. And so I go through this process and I'm like, wow, that's interesting that that the system that's calling all the shots is your central nervous system. Look at this. This is what just happened. Yay. That's we a, good. We have for a special your... guest. This is Hi, special Berman. guest. Herman. This is the Hermanator. Our Hermanator. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's cool. Um, imagine what's calling all the shots is your, is your central nervous system. Central at the core of you system. You're, you're an operating system. You're a computer. And right there in the middle is nervousness. Don't touch that. Don't suggest that to the boss. Don't move there. And yet we've done nothing to combat that reality. So the idea of the central courage system is to combat like the standard operating system of your brain, which is nervousness. And if you could actually learn how to build a central courage system for yourself or for your team, that would be the competitive advantage. And so we talked to tears about our whys, like know your why, find your why, but not much about the how great. You want to be courageous. How do you do it in a way that's not careless? And that, that is the concept of the central courage system. The idea of becoming courageous, it comes at a price. If it was easy, everyone would do it. And as you mentioned, Greg, my acronym is actually price P R I C E. Um, Each letter gets a chapter in the book. It stands for prioritize, rally, identify, commit, and execute. The first two steps Prioritize and rally are organizational health steps. It's prioritized through values. And what I'm seeing is that companies are really not honoring the values of the business. They haven't made choices, so they've got too many. Or they're honoring like the founder's values who maybe aren't as relevant as they once were or not in the business anymore. Right. And so if they really want to honor the founders of the business, keep the business relevant. Evolve the values forward. So everything in the book sort of like like showcases other companies, how they're doing it, how they're making choices. I always like to say core values are not eye rolls. They're how the exceptional role. And the companies that are rewarding people off their values have the right people in the company who are pushing the company forward, which leads us to the R, which is rally believers. This is all about belief system. If your values are real, it should be easier to get belief inside the organization. When the values are not authentic, it's going to be a really, really hard time to find your people. And I, I think as a guy that studied leadership now, the word leadership worries me because many leaders turn leadership into cheerleadership and they rah-rah to their staff. They think they're picking up their staff, but you kind of see right through that and it actually does the opposite effect of what you want. So in the book, one of the concepts we talk about is believership. Like the sole goal of leadership is believership. Are you making believers out of your staff? Are you making believers out of your board or out of your customers or prospects? And I think you even make believers or fake believers. And sadly, fake believers don't wear a t-shirt around the office that says fake believer. They just nod and smile and collect a paycheck. Mm -hmm. So you don't really get to pass go to the courageous business steps without getting these first two on lockdown, get your values tight, reevaluate them, go back to the basics. And then honor those values. Make sure you're making believers inside your organization. When you don't, you're going to have conflict. Ask yourself this particular question. Are you in a watcher back culture or a gotcha back culture? Mm -hmm. 
you're in a got your back culture, it's probably because the values are real and people believe in them. If you're in a watch your back culture, maybe there's an eye roll happening and that's a problem. Yeah. And don't you believe in talking about believing um, the courageous employees, the courageous ones are going to be the ones that have the opportunity to speak to even upper, upper management. So president, CEO, whatever, about how they might review and relook at the situation, right? Um, and those people are courageous enough to take a chance. They're the ones that say, hey, I'm willing to change this company. I'm really willing to work on the values. I'm a big enough person. I don't stand here, um, you know, nothing political aside, but, you know, where we are today, you know, somebody who doesn't listen to a lot of people, right? Um, my point is, is that um, th that to me is probably one of the biggest courageous steps that somebody could take would be uh, helping that person evolve their consciousness to understand who they really are and what this company really stands for. What it started out as, Ryan, may not be what it is today. But that person may not have the glasses on to actually see that anymore. They've gotten tired. They've gotten worried. They've been beat up by all kinds of things. They're older now. They're seeing, you know, they're racing to the end of the, uh, the tunnel. But the company is truly uh, very, very um, av available, right? There's a lot of resources. I see this happen all the time. So would you agree with that? Uh, totally. I think, I think. The magic word in you, you said it already is willingness. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and I think it's a two way street. You know, I think, I think the word willing is one of the most underrated words in the dictionary. And um, that's funny. The, the other title I was playing around with for the book that I, I thought it was too narrow was willing courage brands. Hmm. And the reason I like the word willing is like, are you open to hearing another perspective? I'm willing to actually hear out your take. And then, hey, once we agree on a direction, I'm going to will it through. We're going to grit it through. We're going to find a way to will through this hard situation. And as you stated already, like change is hard. There's no question that change is a hard thing. But I think the hardships of not changing will be far harder. And so when you have employees that are close to the work, that's the other thing is, you got a lot of leaders and suffering from ivory tower syndrome who are, they're too far away from the work, but they don't trust their employees enough to allow them to make a call. Right. Right. And so the sooner you're willing to hear out an employee, the sooner you are to like address change and take it, take it on straight on. Yeah. Now you mentioned to undercover and create one big rally cry in our why Just to talk yeah. about why. Um, Simon Sinek's been on the show, so cool. he's the big why, why, why guy, right? Um, you say that it, purpose, our brand must be truthful, purposeful, emotional, and differential. Mm -hmm. um, can you explain the importance of really discovering our purpose and our why? Because look, there's a ton of discussion out there, you know, and I'm not saying my listeners haven't heard a lot about it. They have about you know, defining your purpose, defining your why, driving toward your values. But I can only stress this enough for this reason. Because if that's what guides you every morning when you wake up, right? That in essence is going to be the courage brand. You are the courage brand. It might be the alter ego. But the point is, is if you're on purpose, you're usually on fire. You're usually really fired up about something you're you're happy, you're pleased to get up in the morning, you like doing it. So what? explain that if you would, because you've got a process in the book, you talk about purpose and why quite a bit. Yeah, so this comes in the C of price. So just to put a bow on, the I is identify fears. And there's a famous proverb that fear and courage are brothers, that you actually can't get to the courageous choice without first channeling it through fear. And mm -hmm. I would say being proactive on knowing what could take your business down is important. And I would say that's a knowledge gathering tool. What you're talking about, like knowing your why, finding your why, and making sure there's an actual rally cry in that why, I would put under the faith side of the business. So it is a, it's the C, commit to a purpose. And yeah, I think Simon completely got it right that we need to know our why. But why do we need to know our why? 
So I think this next generation, which makes up 75% of our workforce, you know, they think I messed up their, their, this world, by the way, and they want to fix it. And the way they look at it is, is through the businesses that they work on because every decision they make, they wear on their sleeves. I like to say they want to have their cake. They want to eat it too. And they want the cake to be gluten-free. <laughs> but like it has, as, as leaders, our job is to create that environment for them. Right. It's like, not, it's not on them. Like I, the owners who are saying this, this generation is entitled is missing the point of the generation because th those they're going to walk out. So if they're driven by purpose, then you have to find your true rally cry and your why. I actually think the way you can go about it, and this is kind of Star Wars 101, is really thinking about what the enemy of your business is. Mm -hmm. What enemy are you trying to take down? Is it good versus evil? Is it like even T-Mobile, okay? T-Mobile, they believe it's a restraint. Like why would you ever lock yourself uh, constraints. Why would you ever lock yourself into a contract? So their rally cry and their why is is contract freedom. Right. Right. Uh, Method Soap, another one. Um, again, I love this topic because it's a soap company. Like they found a way to make soap cool, by the way. But they looked at the back of the ingredients, realized that nobody, these can't be, these 16 syllable words can't be good for you. Why do you have to wear these rubber gloves to clean your house? And they basically made a cleaner version of soap. And their, their purpose is the people against dirty. Are you for dirty or against dirty? Okay. Now, if you're 23 years old, then this, they have, by the way, method, I think is making over hundred million in annual sales at target alone. And if they could take a commodity category like soap and inject it with true purpose, right? Are we for clean? Or are we for dirty? We're for clean and make that cool. And people are like, they're on a mission to do that every day. We're the, we're the clean clean though. You know we're what the, I mean? In other words, we're not using chemicals. We're the clean clean, meaning we're, we're like pure uh, detergents. You were just talking about, yep. you know, millennials and the people that are buying this. Well, we're all buying it now because most of us are in to, in this case, I'm going to use that example method. We want to have clean clean. Yes. We don't want chemicals all over the place. So they, you know, again, they got their product right, which allowed them to be more courageous with their storytelling. Right. Um, and maybe that's part of this is like, you know what? You're, if you're having a hard time faking your purpose, maybe go back to the roots. Right. Because this, this idea is not going away of finding a true purpose. And like you said, when, you, when, you, when you've got your purpose, um, people are excited to come to work every day. It's going to minimize attrition. And I think you're just maximizing authenticity anyway. Yeah, so true. Now, you mentioned that you're an action guy, and I get that. And uh, that to execute our action, there are two distinct paths, a new offering and a new message. Mm -hmm. All right, we we're just talking about method, right? Yep. It's a new offering. It's a new message, yep. right? Couldn't, uh, couldn't be any better than that. Uh, why are these two so important? I think, you know, even when I work with people on branding per se, or helping them re-see uh, the company in a different light, it usually comes down to messaging, right? It, it does come down to messaging. And obviously with that message is always an offer, whatever that offer might be. Look, you're the marketing guy. So explain those two and explain really drive home how important they are. They're just super important. Well, again, not only are they important, but again, do they pass sort of the the, right, the, the test, ro the rock skipping test? Right, right. Right. Like you think it's important, but like when the rock skips across the, the lake, if it keeps skipping and people keep talking about it because it's, it's real, you actually have a shot. Now, let's say in your heart, you know that your product needs to evolve because method, they looked at the category and they got the product part right. right. Another story, you look at Domino's Pizza. Great example of a company that was going the wrong way, uh, had three years of negative sales and I think 2003, their stock price was at $2.84. Yeah. And um, they, they went back to the well on their product. That's not a small company. They changed everything from the crust up. Um, and after three years of negative sales, they, they came back out with an offer um, that's called, oh, yes, we did. They actually, they launched their campaign during the NFL playoffs. So imagine, and the way they did it, by the way, is they showed focus groups of people hating on their pizza. 
So literally, the, they showed their pizza sticking to a box, or um, just people just hating on it. And like, imagine for one second, like you're a franchisee owner in Boise, and you're like three beers in when this commercial. <laughs> right? Like, are you a happy camper? Uh, and so Russell uh, Russell Weiner he uh, he 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 shared that he had a couple tough phone calls, but the commercial basically said, "We've heard you, America." Oh yes, we did. We changed everything from the crust up, and we cleaned up our act. They cleaned up their act and like they spent their own money to tell America that their pizza sucked. And then they cleaned up their act and very vulnerable with America. And, um, you know, after all those tough calls that Russell got, he also said when that commercial ran, just one commercial ran during the NFL playoffs that they were two days from running out of pepperoni, Mm. like enormous spike. Um, Now Domino's, they see themselves not just as a pizza company now, they see themselves as a tech company. So you can order your favorite pizza with an emoji or there's hot spots at the beach. They spent a ma- major investment on p- the perfect pizza delivery car all through the, the, the lens of, oh, yes, we did. So if it's an, oh, yes, we did moment, they do it. And if it isn't, they don't spend money on it. My favorite part of this story, Greg, is a decade later from $2.84, what do you think the stock price was? Today, what do you think? Yeah, you can, you can go today. Uh, let's say it's uh, 170. So as of last week, which is the last time I checked, it's over 400 dollars. There you go. Their return on courage from three bucks to 400 on cheese sauce and dough. Mm-hmm. Okay, again, another commodity arena. So if they can do it, and again, this is a scenario where they got their product right, were vulnerable with America, got America to take them back. Oh yes, we did, and. The beauty of this story is Russell, the president now, he was a CMO at the time, did not hire or fire anyone in that first year. He kept the exact same team that was responsible for three years of negative sales in place for that rocket ship. Well, and remember the investment that they made um, as we speak here, this was all pre-COVID. And after COVID, right, any of these companies that had automated and come out with everything digital have done amazing. I mean, look at Chipotle, look at all of them, because you can order with an app, you can go pick it up, it's da 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 da. So uh, to their, they saw around corners, maybe they maybe they didn't see the, co- uh, the COVID coming, but um, that didn't hurt anything with relation to the sales. No, the co- COVID months. helped their business, no doubt. No yeah, question, yeah, they're, yeah, they're, yeah. they're hiring drivers. I mean, I think yeah. a decade in the, the stock price was at 300 bucks today, it's over 400. And yeah. Yeah, no doubt. So it's you know you look at all these restaurants like that the big boys that are that are playing and and have the money and investment to do that it's great now Ryan in closing the interview what key points would you like to leave the listeners with in becoming courageous and in creating their own courage brand let's just say you're talking to one individual out there who markets themselves as a consultant and then you're talking to somebody who has a company with hundreds of employees who's trying to create a courageous brand, what are the what are the key points you'd like to leave them with? Yeah, for one, I, I would say that change is happening whether you like it or not, right? And, and you need courage for change, right? So why wouldn't you drive change versus change driving you? Mm-hmm. Change driving you is not a terrible thing in some places. COVID's a great example. I mean, I think the, the, the late adopters have had to force themselves to change. I think the big difference between you driving change and change driving you, if you're driving change, that's proactive. That's courage. I think if change is driving you, that's reactive. That's resilience. I think those are different. Both great skills to have. But we always say courage brands, they don't just embody change or embrace change. They create the change. And the way they do it is by addressing those business fears. And then they gather knowledge, they build faith, and they take action. My hope is that you can use that. Okay, what do I know? What do I think about this situation in real time? The think is the knowledge. How does it make me feel? The feel is the faith. And what am I going to do about it? The do is the action. And maybe there's a project right now that you're you know it's the right move and you feel it, but you're not taking any action on. And my 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 challenge to you is even if it's a little mistake and you go the wrong way, that's better than sitting being a sitting duck. Learn from the mistake and keep pushing forward. That's great advice. It really is, you know, and as I look over history, I'm a little bit older than you. I come from the days of fax machines 
and servers in your office, right? And now everything's in the cloud. You can operate these businesses. We're not faxing anymore. I'm just using that. Um, we don't use Palm Pilots where we're you know, we're pushing data back and forth between somebody. And I will say if you, there's one thing that most of the listeners need to pay attention to, it's the fact if you don't believe technology is going to revolutionize something, you better think again. Uh, because with AI and the things that I see happening, and I, I just use an example, um, and this is a quick one. It's an app, and it's called uh, Just... Uh, press to record or something. It, it's there. And the AI is so good, Ryan, that 99% of what I have on the Apple iPad, it picks it up, it's corrected it and so on. When you look at just that about even writing a book and dictating a book, I'm talking to some of my author people that want to write books today. I'm like, hey, if there's an app you could just talk to and you just keep speaking your book until you get there, right? If you have that kind of brain, you got to be wired that way. But I would always say with what you said, the courage to embrace technology, no matter how old you are, just keep embracing technology and you'll probably stay at the forefront. Uh, for my listeners, we've been on with Ryan Berman. We've been talking about his book, Let Me Move My Hand, Return on Courage. Uh, it's a great book. Uh, it is filled with stories, information, and opportunity to people pick this up. And actually, as you said, embrace change. If there's any one thing this will do, it will help you to embrace change. Ryan, it's been a pleasure having you on Inside Personal Growth, spending a few minutes with us uh, today. And uh, namaste to you and a little puppy there too. <laughs> he's right here. Yeah, he's still right here. And, uh, I'm sure I'll see you around the neighborhood sooner than later, Greg. I'm sure we will. Thanks so much, Ryan. Bye, man.